started now. Let's everybody get a songbook and turn to number 69. 69. Somebody stand, don't Spoken by that braced hand. Got lots of them. Ask you to remember me as I go for testing on Friday on my arm. Hopefully, they can figure out what's going on there. I'd like to ask Brother Walt if he would lead us in prayer. Brother Walt. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the 
Dear precious Lord, Father, and heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Lord, forgive us of any sin or cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, just bless this service this evening with Heavenly Father. Just bless the singing tonight and the worship and the preaching. Lord, be with um, each and every prayer request, Lord, that we've made here today, Lord, and all the concerns that we have, Heavenly Father. Those who couldn't be here, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd be with them and just give them a touch at home for where they may, they may be here, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Also remember those that they are visiting um, this evening, all the jam kids that they're visiting and giving them some food and some lessons and things like that. And also by that same token, if you want to help out with preparing the lesson, preparing the food and stuff like that, just get a hold of Shell and she'll let you know what they need. Also regarding things like that, there's a sign up sheet in the back for Christmas play. And nobody signed up yet, so we may not have a Christmas play. <laughs> so, um, so the sign-up sheet in the back, if you're willing to participate in any form or fashion, just sign up on what you're willing to do. Appreciate that. We're trying to figure out what to do and figure out what our cast is. So, All right. Any testimonies or specials tonight? Anybody at all? Silence. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Well, I'm going to stand up and praise the Lord. Thank you for being loving, so loving and merciful. But, and there's no way I could ever thank you for every preaching that I've come with you. Amen. You know, it's just like if we get older, especially. We don't have a whole lot of strength sometimes. Right. And always before I go to do anything, I ask him to help me. And you know he never fails you. Yep. He does give me the strength to do and take care of what I need to take care of. And I want to praise him and thank him for being my love and he's saved. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? I want to thank God for His wonderful love. He's been so good to me. And I can never thank Him and praise His name enough. I just wish I could tell the whole world. Amen. That they need a Savior. We do need to pray for one another more. Right. And I know I'll fail to thank God as much as I should for all the many blessings He's blessed us with. But you know, the best is yet to come. Right. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? You ready, Robert? No. <laughs> Seventy six. Seventy six.
Good evening, everybody. How are we doing out there <laughs> in Radio Land? All right, turn your Bibles to Romans in chapter 13, and we'll get into the study. Here's a somber spirit here today. Maybe it's a sleepy spirit, not a somber spirit. So... Okay, we are in um, Romans in chapter number 13, that's where we're at, and okay. 13, are you there? Say amen. Okay, we're going to read a few verses uh, which we read last week, and then jump back into the same study, the study on authority. We have began last week an introduction on the subject, and we're going to be here for a few more weeks, uh, not exactly in this passage, but on the topic of authority. Uh, verse number 1 of chapter 13 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be ordained, uh, be, are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth, doeth evil. All right, so we're going to stop there, and uh, we're not going to touch everything in these passages tonight, but hopefully by the end of the study we will. And so let's start off with prayer, and then we'll get into our lesson, okay? We love you, Father, and we thank you. Again, we, we come upon this topic uh, that's so very important. I would say that this subject is so very grave. It's sober. It's, it's, um, it's perhaps a subject that in general is, is maybe the depth and the, and the effect, the consequences are not even grasped. Help us, Lord, to get understanding of it and to make it a part of our daily Christian living. We thank you. You're faithful and good and just and holy and almighty. We value you, Lord. You are most valuable to us. And we exalt you as our God. And thank you for the salvation that you've given us and forgiveness of sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So last week we began in this passage. We looked at two different pa two different phrases in chapter uh, chapter thirteen verses one. Uh, the first phrase was "There is no power but of God." The second phrase, "The powers that be are ordained of God." And this was really the whole lesson last week. We understood that that God is the sole source of all authority. He is He is over all, controlling of all. He is Lord of all. But we also noticed, of course in the scriptures that he is the one that ordains those ones that have authority. And last week we cited three specific institutions, two of which we know were started by God, the family and the church. One, which I can't say was started by God, but God has chosen to ordain, and that is government. And so God ordains his, his authority to these different institutions, and he uses them according to his will. Now there can be other things or other institutions that perhaps may have uh, God's authority upon them. But these three, as we mentioned last week, are consistent. We see that consistently. There are those illustrations for a time, a period, uh, for one particular uh, ordeal situation. God may raise someone up uh, and grant him, ordain him with his authority and use him in that capacity. But we know consistently in our lives, we know the home, the church, and the government are those three institutions that God has ordained his authority into. And so that's where we were at last week. And next week we're going to talk about the spheres of these influences or fears of these, these authorities. But tonight we're going to talk about two words uh, which deal with our responses to authority. None of us are going to get away from that. <laughs> you know, we make the joke about the young man said, I'm tired of all the rules around the house. I'm sick and tired of this. I'm going to join the military, you know. <laughs> and we laugh about that. Uh, but really, honestly, I know parents can be a little overbearing at times. Amen. Yeah, all right. Uh, but honestly, uh, that's probably the easiest living you'll ever have. 
you get outside of the home and uh, you have a lot of people that perhaps are not barking orders to you so directly like a mother or a father would bark them to you but you in turn find yourself really wrapped up with all of the regulations and do's and don'ts and things you can and cannot do and so forth and it can really be taxing especially as a young person you know uh, and so young people leave the home many times not really grasping the responsibility of caring for themselves financially but understanding they still and maybe even more so than ever are under authority they still and more perhaps more than ever are uh, under authority and uh, it's so sobering because um, as one man said you're, you're really not ready to lead anything until you learn to follow can I get amen on that and so it's good for children to learn to follow and that will help and assist them and prepare them so that they one day can lead they can lead their families and lead in the church and lead in a children's program and lead perhaps even in government, whatever capacity they may be. But no doubt the worst leaders are the people who are the worst followers. You agree with that? Yeah, I do. And so our responses to this, uh, to authority in our life, is listed here in the Scriptures. Really two main responses, that of subjecting ourselves or submitting ourselves. Secondly, that of resisting. So subjection and resisting. Already we have a sinner walking down the aisle, coming to get right with God. And say, so, come on, brother, come on. And so, uh, but it's subjection, subjection or resisting. And that's the two, our two responses to it. Now, again, I want to emphasize authority is a constant in my life. I can't, I'm not going to, I, I, years ago I watched a, a um, I think it was a Laurel and Hardy. That's terrible to mention that behind the pulpit. And then I it was a Laurel and Hardy, I don't know, it was in some old, uh, old uh, uh, rendition, one of these black and white comedy. And uh, one of them inherited a lot of money. And the other one said, I know what we'll do with the money. Let's, let's, uh, let's take and we'll just run away somewhere. And in the process of inheriting the money, he also inherited an unoccupied island somewhere in the South Pacific. And so uh, in the process of attaining their inheritance, they lost all the money. The lawyers took it all. And he said, well, we still have our land. And I said, let's just go to that land. We'll start our own land. We'll call it Utopia. And so uh, they set sail. They had to, uh, you know, had to, they were stowaways on some different ships. And, and they finally made it to their island, picked up a couple other people with them. And this is going to be Utopia. And he said, number one, there's no rules and no laws on this land. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we're all just going to be kind and help each other and so forth. And it was four of them. And they loved life and enjoyed it. And everybody had a great time. And then one night, in the middle of the night, they woke up to this t terrible ruckus. And there was people by the hundreds just pulling in on ships and boats. And they were building things. And they were partying and carrying on and fighting and shooting and so forth. And, and one of them ran out. One of the men ran out and said, hey, wait a minute. We can't do that. We can't do that. He said, wait a minute. This is utopia. There's no rules and there's no laws. You can do whatever you want to do here and he said we can't do that you know he was trying to stop it and so they had to get on the ship and leave utopia and come back to the united states <laughs> uh, but it's just uh, it's it was a, it was funny but it's the truth stop fighting authority it's part of your life and so you're either going to respond to it one way or the other either by submitting to it subjecting yourself to it or by resisting it and uh, this is, you know, it's really timely when we think about things that are taking place in our nation now. Uh, we, uh, we have those that are part of the Antifa movement, which is, which is uh, that's an interesting study itself, what they call themselves and what they stand for. But it's a pure rebel movement of rebellion. And uh, when they all get said and done, you understand not all those turkeys are going to be able to run the streets and shoot and burn things down. You understand that? I mean, there, there's history of other countries that have done the same exact thing. And when it was all said and done, when it was all said and done, they, uh, they ended up with one dictator over everybody who had sovereign rule. And they had to follow authority. And if I was them, I would say, you know, what? we got some pretty good authority today. Now, we, we have our faults. And none of us deny that. But America is still a place where there's freedom. There's liberty. And a play a person can prosper if they'll just apply themselves legally and they just 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 do what is right. They can prosper in this country. And so uh, this is a great place. Now I've I've been traveled and I've lived in uh, lived in another country and it, there's no place that's uh, like this. That's this is unique in that regards. 
And so if, they don't, if they're not careful, they're going to mess up what makes this country great. And then in turn, they go out on the street and try to protest or burn something, they'll find themselves in a prison, which is where some of them ought to be right now. And so anyway, need not get political. Uh, we can talk about that after church, okay? Uh, so here we see response number one is, uh, it says here in verse number uh, 13, or verse number one of chapter 13, the very first phrase, let every soul be subject. And so the word subject here is mentioned many times in the New Testament. I think it's 47 times in the New Testament alone that it's mentioned. The word subject carried with it the idea of, a, of rank and file, like military. And so it's the idea of, of you have a person who is a general and have a person who is a captain or corporal and a sergeant, etc., etc. All of them may have an opinion. All of them have responsibilities. They're all working for a common cause, a common goal. But in turn, they find their place. They find their place in the rank. And they submit to the person that has a higher power. Slightly different than that of obedience. Uh, my children have no rights. Can I get amen on that? Amen? And I, so I tell them, your right is obey. That's your right. You do what you're told, when you're told, how you're told, you know, and etc. And so they don't really have any rights in that regards. And I'm not talking about abusing them. But there, there's no rights there. And so the idea of subjection carries with it the connotation that there are rights that can be the rights that you have. There's responsibilities that you have. And so here in the writing of this, the Bible says that every soul, every person, because no one gets, out of, gets underneath authority, everybody, whether it's a child, whether it's a lady, whether it's a man, whether it's a senior citizen, doesn't matter. Every person, every soul in turn will find themselves under some layer many layers perhaps of authority and so every soul needs to learn to be subject to authority look if you will back in the book of Daniel uh, back in the book of Daniel because undoubtedly uh, undoubtedly the conversation will come up at some point in our lives you know I don't have any trouble following this guy I have no trouble following him I have no trouble listening to, listening to this person and uh, I've been around churches preach revivals and so forth and, and, I've, and I've heard conversations such as that even in the church you know uh, uh, I, I don't like this pastor uh, because of this that and the other and I'm not going to listen to him uh, I like this pastor because of this, that, and the other, and I'm going to follow, and I'm going to, I'm going to help, and I'm going to participate, and so forth. Now, you're in Daniel chapter 2. Are you there? Say amen. You understand the story of Daniel, and we're going to look at a few minutes about Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Daniel, in turn, was a, uh, he was a, um, a good, uh, godly young man who was living in Jerusalem. And uh, he, in turn, was one of the upper echelon. He was a fine young man, an educated young man. He was a young man that was being trained for leadership in the country. Nebuchadnezzar comes to the country, and they tear the walls down, burn the temple, and they take Daniel and many others and turn the best of the best of the young people. And they bring them back to Babylon with them and begin to teach them the ways of the Chaldeans. And for the purpose, distinct purpose of using them. He brought back with some, them those ones who were educated, the artificers, everyone who, had, who could work with their hands, who, who were intelligent, had training, whatever it may be. They brought them all back so it could embellish and make Babylon a greater country. And so Daniel was amongst them. He was one of them. And Daniel here is being used uh, in Daniel chapter 2. He is now interpreting this dream of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. Are you there? Say amen. Notice in verse 20 it says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are His. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom uh, unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Look in chapter number 4, if you will. Chapter 4, this wasn't just just a prayer that he prayed one day, but this was a lifestyle with Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 4, verse number 17. Are you there? Say amen. Uh, notice here in verse number 16. Let, this, let, his, let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast, uh, beast heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Now this is referring to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, in turn, at this point, he was, he was lord over the golden city of Babylon, and uh, he, was, he had 
put placed, uh, pushed e Egypt out of sight. Egypt was no longer a threat. They were now the greatest power in the world. He steps out on his balcony, looks at beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, uh, Babylon, and then he says in his heart, look at this great city that I have built. Look what I have done. He in turn takes credit for what's happened. And at that point, God sends him out to the pasture to stay for about seven years so he can learn who's king. Mm -hmm. Uh, verse number 17 of chapter 4 says this, This man is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the beast of men. The beast of men. Look in chapter 25. It says this, that they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over thee till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whoso, whomsoever he will. Again, verse number 32. And they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou, shall, thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Seems like the Lord's trying to drive a message home. Don't you agree? And so here we see Nebuchadnezzar was taking all this credit and glory. He'd already, he already had destroyed Jerusalem, and he brought all of those people. Like they were wicked people. They were wicked people. And yet the Bible says that God used him as a servant to accomplish his will. And now in the height of his authority and power, he steps out on the balcony looking at his kingdom filled with pride and takes credit for all that is done. And God says, I want to teach you a lesson. Who really is the one that raises a king up and sets him down? Who's really the one that is ruling in the background? Because understand this, that uh, you and I may make our decisions, but our decisions never overthrow the decisions of God. Amen. And that's comforting in times of what we're going through now. That, that, that there is no one person, there is no government, there is no military. They can make their decisions, but there is neither of those that in turn can overthrow the will of God and what God desires, what God wants to accomplish. Look back, if you will, in Psalms in chapter 75. Again, David, he echoes this uh, same sentiment and in uh, Psalms in chapter number 75. Uh, I'm sure it's a verse that you have quoted and read many times. Psalm 75. Are you there? Say amen. Look in verse number 7. It says, But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. And church, can I just say, rest in this comfort that November is coming and God is going to set one down and raise another up. Amen. And we can rest in that. We should pray. We should vote. We should encourage people. We in turn should, should do our part as citizens of our nation. But when it's all said and done, our faith rests in this, that our God is the one that will sit upon the throne whom He wants to be upon the throne. And there is no man that's worthy to rule. There is no man. And though we, we appreciate leaders that we've had in the past and we see the value because they've stood for morality or they've believed in our Constitution or they, and they perhaps have uh, strengthened our military or they've stimulated our economy or in some capacity they helped our nation. Understand, none of them are worthy to rule. God sets one up and takes one down. And what we want is we want God to do what God wants to do. What I don't want is what I deserve. Can I get amen on that? If we get what we deserve in November... Then in turn, I'm going to try to make a rocket ship and go on to heaven. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to figure out, I'm going to, who's that guy making rocket ships, sending people to the moon? Who's that guy? Uh, anyway, I don't want to stick around for that. Uh, so now look back in your New Testament, if you will. So we understand that God is the, God is the one that sets all these authorities up. And I, I can't understand that. And so there's no reason for me to sit here and to uh, uh, babble about this. I don't understand why Fidel Castro's rule and Adolf Hitler's rule, I don't understand understand why stallions come into power and overthrow uh, working governments that are perhaps good for the people. Understand that. Understand why what happened in North Korea happened in North Korea and that how that it changed, become a dictatorship. I don't understand that. And I can't explain it. I just know that the Bible says that God is the one that puts one down and puts one up. I know that. And I, and I think we can see in scriptures that God works from a big picture. Yes. 
And what we're, what's happening today, God's managing all these events, the, the rioting and the burning in Antifa and the corruption in the swamp and all the God's managing our country from a big picture. Not, not from a four-year term. And so it's beyond me to understand it. Because it makes, to my, in my logic, and with, my, with the logic that I have and the, the, the limited understanding that I have, it makes no sense at all that in turn you could allow our government to be handed over to these people. It makes no sense. If that were to happen, in turn, it's it. I mean, we will no, we'll never have any more another presidential election where you have two parties being represented. It'll never happen again. It'll be one party rule. It'll, it'll be a fascist state or it'll slowly grow into a fascist state. What will happen? It makes no sense to me. But in turn, we are not the only country that has faced such, uh, such situations. And we're not the only country that had Christians who lived in churches that existed and preachers that preach and mamas that were loving and raising their kids and praying as we have in our country today. And so, our hope is in God. It's not. It's not in what we can try to manipulate and work, uh, work inside of our society in a, in a wrong capacity. When it's all said and done, God, in turn, is going to accomplish what He wants. No matter who's in the office, He's going to accomplish what He wants. And my hope isn't here anyway, right? Your hope isn't here either. Uh, you're Ephesians chapter 5. And so, uh, let every soul be subject. So what we have to learn to do and, is to respond in a right way to authority. We all have it. We see that. Authority is constant in our life. If you're a five-year-old child, you have authority. Prim 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 primarily, it's your parents. Uh, secondarily, maybe grandparents, extended family. But primarily, it's your parents that you understand. But as we get older, and perhaps the older we get, the more we understand about the layers of authority that touch our lives. And you're not getting away from it. And so with that in mind, we see that God is the one that rules. He sets up, takes down. We see that. And uh, God works from a big picture. He's not working from my situation, my particular circumstance only. Though all things work together for good, for me, for you. When we live a life fully committed to Him, yes, they do. But, they, uh, but he's working from a big picture, and there's always many things that God is doing in one situation. And so having understand, understood all that, let's just take a good look at a few general, picture, uh, general passages about the subject of subjection or submission. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Here we are. I know you ladies hate it. Verse number 22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. Boy, oh boy. Isn't that a good one right there? And yet, again, here we see a home. This is, this, a home uh, represents that... Um, uh, the institution that God has ordained, He's ordained His authority into. And so in that, the scriptures in verse number 22, it says, Wives, submit yourself. Now I know, realize in verse 21, we see that, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. And it is there, and it means exactly what it means. But, but it means more than just me giving in. It means, it means more than that. It's the idea when two recognize that they're, they're under God's authority, then it makes it a lot easier for the two of them to get along. You know, as one man said to me, he said, the reason we have authority is because people can't follow authority. If you and I understood that you're following God's authority and submitted to it, it wouldn't matter who's in charge. If you took a five-year-old child and put it in front of the classroom and said, you'd be in charge, it, it wouldn't matter. But to the ones that it does matter, in turn, that's why we have to have authority. That's exactly what it's saying there. But, but the way God would have it to be is that we understand so much that we are under God's authority that there's not a fight and a struggle between Brother Bob and I, and Brother Carlos and I, and Miss Jesse. Now there's no fight. Because we, we all want what God wants. That's what it's teaching. And so here, wives, submit yourself. Look, if you will, in 1 Peter, uh, because it continues on. Well, my husband, he doesn't know the Lord. He's not saved. Uh, you know, my husband, he's not spiritual, perhaps. Maybe that's the case. And I've, I've heard that before. My husband is not a spiritual man. Uh, he doesn't uh, walk with the Lord. He doesn't read his Bible. He doesn't pray. He doesn't want to do right. What do I do then? First uh, Peter chapter three and verse number one says, "Likewise, ye wives, be sub be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not uh, not the word, not the word." Uh, 
my Bible is ripped right here. They also may without the word uh, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear who's adorned, let it not be with that outward adorning of plating, plaiting of hair or wearing of gold or putting on the peril, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. And so a lot of words, a lot of verses, but it's simply saying this, that ladies, if you have a husband and he's not saved, or, or perhaps he's not one who obeys the Word of God, then the Scripture says be in subjection. That's difficult. That is, and that's why it's so important that we sober our kids about marriage. That's why it's so important. Because when they get married, they now, they now, the, a young lady gets married, she's now walking, she's, she's willingly accepting this authority in her life. She's walking away from a father, and she is now willingly accepting this man in her life. She didn't, have to, she didn't get to pick and choose about it. She's made that conscious decision. Now she has to leave that matter in God's hands. That matter needs to be given to God. Uh, and she just needs to live a life of subjection, and a life with a meek and a quiet spirit to concentrate on a, being a spiritual woman and allow God to do something in her husband's life. Now, I, know, I know we don't like to hear that, but that's the honest truth. Uh, the honest truth is, is that we need to put the pressure where the pressure belongs. And if you have a husband that isn't saved, or a husband that isn't obeying the Lord, the best way to put pressure on that it's for you, young ladies, to live in subjection to your husbands. So we have a 50-50 deal. Well, I reckon, you know, you can, you know, however a husband wants to structure a home, he can. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, you know, he can make that decision. But no matter how you structure it, the, the husband is still the head of the home, period. If he lives in Timbuktu, he's still the head of the home. If he's a no-show, he's still the head of the home. It doesn't matter. When it's all said and done, God's going to talk to the husband about the home because God, he, he ordained the authority to the husband. Period. Now, if the husband in turn wants to designate it inside the home, if he in turn has a wife that, that he feels they, that she's more talented and gifted or whatever, and he wants to, then he can certainly do that. But he's still going to answer to God as head of the home. And so the idea of 50-50, which is, is all born out of this idea of fem feminism. And feminism, you mark it down, it is an anarchic movement. It is a movement of rebellion. A movement of rebellion. I, I remember uh, listening to a story told by Jerry Clower. I got all these spiritual people I'm bringing in. I'm commentating. It was so funny. And he talked back years ago, and he talked about... Um, um, coming into some type of office or something and uh, there was a lady and she in turn was a, a feminist and uh, she came walking into the room and uh, there was only there was no chairs left in the room and he was sitting there. How many of you heard that story? Anybody heard that story? What is wrong with you guys? What? <laughs> It's a funny story. And so he stands up and says, Man, if you can have my chair. And she said, I will not. I will not sit there just because I'm a lady, you know. And she went on and rant and rave. And she said, Well, I'm not going to sit there. And he sat down. She sat down on the floor. And he said, Well, I'm not sitting. He sat down on the floor right beside her. And she ranted and raved and carried on about women's rights and so forth. And, and uh, he looked at her and he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I'm going to tell you about my wife. He said, my wife gets out of bed whenever she wants to. My wife eats anything she wants to eat. My wife has someone that comes in the house and cleans the house for her. You know, my wife drives a Cadillac and carries on. And he said, my wife doesn't want you messing with the deal that she has right now. So leave it alone, you know. Because <laughs> she was going on about how she was going to liberate women, you know. Just free them, you know. And he said, my wife doesn't want to be free. She's uh, fine the way she is. And so, but he took a truth and he, he asked added and made it humorous uh, when a home is operates as it should in turn uh, is not people struggling for rights. A husband doesn't have rights. He has responsibility. And uh, respond, God's the one that has rights. God's the one that's over the home and all those ones in the home, it's their job to in turn to seek God's will and accomplish God's will. 
And uh, the many a husband would just assume, lay down that mantle and step aside and be the one that follows instead of leads. You know, sometimes you get disappointed in yourself. At times you don't want to be the one you know, trying to uh, turn people in the family back toward God or trying to change it. You don't want to do it. And many times people in the home, they interpret it that you're just getting what you want. And so a godly father, a godly husband is not getting what he wants. A godly father, a godly husband is trying to give God what he deserves. And so, um, anyway, I got sidetracked there. Uh, look back, if you will, in uh, Ephesians chapter number 6. And so we see with the home that there's this aspect of uh, submission. Authority is given to the home. And I want to emphasize that by no means at all does men get escape. That they get a free ticket. Men have, they have, they have the position that is heavy responsibility. And in turn, it's a sobering position for them. And I certainly, I, I may at times uh, I joke about this and, and may tease about this, but the Lord knows, and I, I think my family would know this, that I don't, I don't take the position of being a husband or a father as, you know, the world revolves around me and I get everything I want. You know, it's a sobering position. And I believe God has, uh, has given unto me as a father and as a husband to help spiritually lead and guide my family and to protect them spiritually and to lead them spiritually. All right, you're in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Notice here, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Uh, so this is a good passage, but we see again, children, or children have the simple responsibility, this God-ordained authority given to home. Now children, it's very clear, children have responsibility to follow the parents. Uh, that's not very popular today, is it? <laughs> uh, look if you will in Hebrews in chapter 12. It's not very popular at all today. Uh, in fact, you have really the opposite, that children in one way or another are leading their parents or manipulating them. Uh, they're twisting them and somehow uh, carrying on. Um, or parents in turn, they, they're afraid and and they just let their kids do what they want to do. And so here's some more sinners coming in. Come on in, sinners. The altar's open for you. Uh, so there, uh, there's uh, other res responses such as that. But as a parent, as a father, and I think a mother as well, mothers and fathers work together as a team in this. It's our job to exercise authority over parents and to demand nothing less than absolute obedience from the children. To demand it. Uh, there's, there's nothing less. You're teaching that child how to listen to a police officer. You're teaching that child how to act and to treat a teacher at school. A child is learning how to behave when they get out of the classroom. You know, I can still have vivid, vivid memories of my mother. And I, most of my life, it was just with my, grew up with my mother and my brother and I. And uh, but my mother was, she was, uh, she just wouldn't, there was no, only going to be one way, and that's the way she wanted it to be. And it's things she just ingrained in me, how you treat people, what you say. You know, you always say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. You take your shoes off when you go in their house, and, and you don't do this, and you don't do that, and so forth. And at the time, you know, I didn't necessarily appreciate it. But looking back, I understand she, she was a very, very good mother, and she took a responsibility uh, seriously. And she, she would put up with nothing else other than obedience. That was it. That was it. I mean, she, there was nothing else she was going to take from me but obedience. I had to give that to her. And so that's exactly what God wants uh, from our children in turn, you're in uh, Hebrews 12. Are you there? Say amen. Uh, I just pulled this passage out because it talks about the idea of chastening. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Verse 6, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is, is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, where of all are partakers, then are you bastards. That's a fatherless child. And not sons. Verse 9, furthermore, we have, we have had our fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. I like that. You know how to get reverence from your children? Correct them. 
uh, shall we not much rather be in subjection to the heavenly and to the Father of spirits and live? And so it's just a good passage to meditate on uh, that uh, this idea of corporal punishment inside of the home is expected. And uh, really, I, I'm really far more, I didn't even get onto this, but I, I'm, far more, I'm far more on immediate, immediate punishment for something as opposed to this two-year punishment or two weeks or two-month punishment of anything. Justice should be, should be clear, and it should be executed quickly, and then completely forgotten. You know? I think when we hang things over a kid's head, that's the act, that's the works of Satan. That's condemnation. How many of you live with things hanging over your head that Satan comes and reminds you of all the time? Come on, be honest with me. I fight that all the time. Satan comes and he hangs over me, stands before God, no doubt, and is the accuser of the brethren. And he places these thoughts in mind. You this, and you that, and you this, and you that. Hangs condemnation. Well, thank God, my God, my Father hangs no condemnation over me at all. You know, he, he in turn, his judgment on my sin was very clear, it was very quick, and it was done and completely forgotten. And that was, of course, with Christ. But it's done. And uh, so it's forgotten. And it's good, it's good, it's good verse for us to remember. But with that, we see uh, the idea of, uh, of punishment uh, as far as, and I think it's a better word, is really correction, not punishment, uh, that is carried on in a home, is that we're, we're really, it's corrective measures you're trying to bring in a child's life. You're not really trying to get revenge upon them. You know, you did this, I'm going to get you back. <laughs> you know, and that's, I think that that's probably a more common way that, that parenting is looked upon. I'm going to get you back because you did this. Uh, but the purpose of chastisement was to correct. You're going this direction. You're going the wrong way. So we've got to stir you into the right path. And, and I'm going to bring the measures into your life so I can get you on the right path because that path is going to end up in destruction. And so it's supposed to be absent of hate and anger and, and a vengeful spirit and so forth. You know, none of that. I mean, if a parent is struggling with those attitudes whenever they go to discipline their child, they really ought to stop and uh, wait. And uh, I've waited I've waited days, waited weeks before I've dealt with things because I was, I was fighting anger. And I don't want to uh, hurt them. Not to say that I haven't, in turn, uh, used anger. And uh, none of you guys say anything, okay? But I've, uh, I certainly uh, don't want chastisement to be interpreted as anger because God is God's not angry with me today. And uh, some of the sweetest times of my life has been the chastisement of the Lord. You know, uh, he's he just like he said to Cain. He said, "If you just just do right, I'll receive your sacrifice." And some of the sweetest times of my life has been when the Lord has brought correction in my life, and I've had such felt such closeness with Him. And so we um, again instituting we see this institution of the home is is God's ordained as authority. And so with that, there are those participants that live in subjection. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's move on to number next, okay? We uh, look, if you will, in 1 Peter in chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2, and i got to hasten. I need to hasten. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, Romans chapter 13 is referring to, in general, the principle of authority, but it seems to become really a little more specific about citizenry and uh, kings, etc. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2 is where we're at. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Notice here, it says in verse number 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, um, and, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers or for the praise of them that do well for so is the will of God verse number 18 servants and, and, and it might help you if you write above that slaves slaves okay uh, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. And of course, Ephesians chapter 5 talks about, or Ephesians chapter 6 talks about these slaves, that they not obey by eye service. In other words, whenever the master is looking at them, that they really do well, but behind their back they talk about them and they don't work properly. 
And so it's not a talking about an employee-employee relationship. This is a legal, this is a legal, uh, uh, this is a, a person who's owned legally by another man. And though we say, oh, I don't agree with slavery, well, that's, that's, that point is mute. At this, I mean, this, gen, at this uh, part of, this, uh, of, of, of Bible history, it's mute. In the Roman Empire, two-thirds of the people were slaves. And so uh, God deals with slavery in a different way. We deal with it by holding up signs and burning down buildings. God deals with it a different way. And He deals with it the same way He teaches ladies in 1 Peter chapter number 3. You have a husband that doesn't obey the Word, who's not a spiritual man, who isn't saved. Let me tell you how to take care of it. Meek and a quiet spirit, and you live in subjection to that man. And you get, a, you get someone who's in slavery who likewise, who like a man who's in slavery, likewise in this case, slavery in turn, the back of slavery was broken. And in turn, it happens by the, by the goodness in men, not by the anarch, anarchism of man, the protesting and the fighting. That's not how it happens. And so we see here that... Um, that uh, we understand that uh, government in turn is ordained to God, perhaps not uh, founded by God, but is ordained of God. And we have the responsibility, uh, responsibility to, uh, to submit, to be in subjection to that. In Romans chapter 13, it specifically says, pay your taxes. Oh. <laughs> Don't you hate that one? Uh, I, this, preacher, uh, this preacher said, uh, he was so upset about it, and he said, he was talking about paying, taking, paying taxes, and he was so upset because the government waste money. They just waste it. You know? And it, so when he wrote out his check to pay his taxes one year, he said, he said, the Inferno, the Inferno Revenue Service. And so they cashed it. And so the next time he wrote it, the Eternal you know, revenue service. They cashed it, you know. And finally he repented. He said, I know I'm doing wrong. He said, I'm just so angry at him because they, I have to pay these taxes and yet they in turn uh, rob the rich to pay the poor and, or rob the poor to pay the rich, I mean. And he said, they're just taking advantage of people. And he repented of it. You know, all that in turn, we have to leave to God. It's going back to the concept of the big picture. I don't understand all of that. But even if the government takes away from us, we have the promise that God takes care of us. Can I get amen on that? And God will take care of us. And so we see uh, this and many other passages of Scripture that helps us understand that we are to subject ourselves to governments. Now you say, wait a minute. And we'll deal with that in uh, next week when we talk about the spheres of authority. Because you'll say, well, what about their limits? Yeah, we're going to deal with that. Uh, look, if you will, in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, just a page over. 1 Peter 5. Uh, this, this next uh, institution is acted out. We see a lot of writing of this uh, through Romans, through the book of Acts, and through the epistles, primarily written by Paul, this idea of the church and our submission to it. But it's very clear when Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, 5, verse 1, he says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucres, uh, not for filthy lucre, but of ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And so these first three verses really are really addressed to a person such as myself, as a pastor, an elder in a church. But verse number 5, it says, uh, Likewise, ye young, younger, younger, submit yourself unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. And this is one of the many passages. But we understand that, that in a church setting, uh, and that in a church setting, that there's likewise, there's likewise subjection that is practiced in a church setting as well. And uh, can I say to you, a pastor is not the dictator of the church. Christ is the head of the church. And so it's similar to that of a home and should be of a government. In turn, God is a sole source of authority. And, and inside of this church, there are boundaries. There's limitations to what uh, any, you know, any person in rule or leadership that they would have. They don't have, you know, unlimited power. You know, this is, my name's not Jim Jones. Can I get a name on that? And really, that's what he did. He, took, he exercised unlimited power over the parishioners, those ones within his church. 
And so there's limitation. And it, the limitation is, is far more limited than what we acknowledge. And uh, far more limited than what's being practiced. And I honestly believe a lot of the unhealthiness that's taken place in our churches is because of that. That we in turn have not exercised the authority that we do have and we're exercising authority that we don't have. Believe that. I believe that wholeheartedly. And if... Uh, if Lord will, I hope to elaborate on that in the next week. Uh, next week we get into uh, the service. But, but having, said, uh, having said all of that, we know the leadership of a church watches over the souls like a father does, like the government does, as it mentions in Romans 13. We understand that. And our place when we are under authority is subjection. And so we've established that you're not going to get away from it. Every soul, let every soul be subject. You're not going to get away from authority. Go ahead and join the military. You're not going to get away from authority. <laughs> you know, run away to the island utopia. You're not going to get away from authority. So we've established that. We've also established that God is the one that raises up and sets down. And when it comes to men such as Nebuchadnezzar or other people who in turn abuse their authority, as I, as I feel that we're suffering today from people that abuse their authority, listen, they, they will not get away with what they're doing. God keeps the balance. He keeps record of all that. And God, in one way or another, He'll deal with it. That, that's the reason why, by the way, that Jerusalem laid in ruins and they were exiled into Babylon because of that very reason. And so, uh, and then Nebuchadnezzar obviously didn't learn the lesson. And so now he finds himself seven years, you know, in a pasture uh, on all fours eating. Uh, and so, because he didn't learn the lesson. And so it's not my job to, you know, correct leaders. Uh, God will take care of leaders, and He does a good job at that. And my job is to be in subjection, right? So subjection has limitations, and that's what we'll deal with in the next week, and uh, dealing with the limitations of subjection. But for you and I, I think we really need to test our own, take a test of our own submission. Uh, a lot of people talk about uh, this idea of submission. Uh, I have to be in submission. I have to obey. I have to do things. And a lot of times what they're really complaining about is that people are asking them to do things that they don't want to do. And uh, th that's not at all, has nothing to do with anything, you know. Uh, you know, if you're, in sub if you're in subjection, then it's just a given. You're going to be asked to do things you don't want to do. And, you know, that's the reason why we fight in our marriages, because you have two different people that want two different things, that, that in turn one is a female, one is a male, which in turn interests are different, all of that. And just all jokes aside, that's the reality of it. There's two wills that are there. And so there's, there's no hallmark companionship. Those are developed by hard work and sweat. It's developed because two people in turn are committed to God, and, and they, in turn, want to exercise biblical principles and try to grow together in the right way. But there's no, you don't meet him. Ah, oh, you know, Hallmark. They see each other, the eyes. And then by the end of the movie, the lips touch. You know, oh, this magic. It isn't like that. It isn't. Because that lady has a will. And there are some things she doesn't want, she does want. And that man has a will. And there's some things he wants and he doesn't want. And so uh, being in subjection doesn't mean... Uh, it doesn't, I mean, this idea of subjection, it's just a given. You're going to be asked to do things you don't want to do. And so the given, uh, what people will say then is, uh, you know, I'd rather obey God than man. Or the Lord told me and so forth. And okay, they'll get so spiritual. They're spiritual about nothing else. But whenever it comes to doing something that they don't want to do, they get really I prayed about it. You know, I was uh, reading an article of uh, a couple and uh, they are, they started a, I won't tell you. It's a Christian couple, and they're very well known. If I mentioned who they are, you would know who they are. And uh, they have been divorced for probably two years, year or two years, and they haven't, it hasn't gotten out. They haven't let anybody know about it. They've taken fake pictures with their kids. They've staged scenes to make it appear as though they're still married, but they're not married. And finally it came out, and they said, well, we want to let you know. We've been praying and praying and praying about it and seeking counsel, and we, you know, and, and we just had to make the hard decision. I mean, they said it in such a way as though that God led them to do it. And so it was, I was reading it. I thought I had to read it over again and, 
and read it again. I thought, I don't, I don't get this. They're writing this and they're expressing it in such a way that, that they in turn are receiving honor for what they're doing, disobeying God. And so, <clears throat> in turn, following, being in subjection is most at times the most difficult thing you'll ever do in your life. And uh, you say, you don't understand. I do understand. Uh, there's some things that I haven't practiced real well, but this is one thing that I have practiced in my life. And I've been on a lot of pressure with it in the past, trying to learn and understand what was right and how to do and so forth and so on. And this has by far been the hardest thing I've done as a Christian is to be in subjection to people that were bad or people that were evil or people in time that were mean, people that used you, etc., etc. And I'm talking about, you know, even in the ministry setting. Um, and so I understand. And I guess that's why uh, the idea of being in a position of authority, it's, it's very sobering to me because I have seen, and myself, I've been a, been a part of those relationships where authority was misused. And it can be very hurtful to people. And so back to... Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 9. Don't turn there because the time is getting away from me. But we see that uh, uh, we need to understand that the authority that God has placed over life is God, the authority that God has placed over our life. He has ordained, is given to us. That authority there is there as a testing ground for whether or not we will follow God. That's what that means. And so... Um, God uses people, and sometimes uh, they're the most unlikely people to test to see our ability to submit, whether or not we really believe. Now, I have to hasten because of time. Uh, the second response, that is subjection, but the second response is that of rejection or resistance. And we see that mentioned in verse number one as well, or verse two, who's so resistive? Who's who resisted the power? Now it's talking directly about authority. This idea of resisting is exactly, you know, it's anarchy. It's what it is. It's, it's, uh, it's battling. It's fighting. Whosoever fights against, they, they refuse. They, they kick back against it. This ordinance, this uh, authority that God has placed in their life. Look back, if you will, so we won't uh, miss any words. In Romans chapter 13, uh, verse number... Uh, two, it says, Whosoever therefore resisteth against the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, the damnation part we'll get into next week. But let's just talk about the idea of, of resisting. God, there's one thing we do know about our Lord, is He's a God of order. And everything that God is involved with demonstrates His order. One thing we know about man is man is given to disorder. And the only reason that man has order is because there's been someone that's influenced them to have it. You know, I, I, I just, I want to give examples, I just can't because of time. And so, we're watching in our society a giving away to disorder. And so in every way, with our arts, with our lifestyle, with our music, with our dress, with our music, with you know, everything. I mean, we're just watching and giving away to disorder. And, and those, those things are secondary. What's primary is relationships. Uh, that who is in charge of what? And presently we have a president in office that, um, that, that, that understands order and is practicing order, but yet we're getting so much kickback from that. Uh, because nobody, in their mind, nobody should be in charge. Uh, just the bully. You know, people just bully around and get what they want, but there's not really an idea of order. And so God wants an order, and that's how things should flow. That's how He's going to work, is by way of order. Look back, if you will, in Jeremiah chapter 27. I, I hope that I don't make a mistake from getting into this. Time-wise, I I'm, uh, almost want to wait until next week. We're in Jeremiah 27. Are you there? Say, ma'am. Give you a moment. Jeremiah 27. 
Verse 1, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came the word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord to me, Make thee bonds and yokes, and put them upon thy neck, and send them to the king of Edom, and to the king of Moab, and the king of the Ammonites, and the king of Tyrus, and to the king of Zidon, by the hand of the messengers which come to Jerusalem unto Zedekiah, king of Judah, and command them to say unto their masters, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus shall ye say unto your masters, I have made the earth and the man and the beast that are upon the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me. And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant and the beast of the field. Have I given him also to serve him and all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the very time of of this land come, and then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. Did you catch that? Now, that, now this is prior to what we read in the book of Daniel. This is prior. This was in Daniel's lifetime. Daniel's a young boy at this time running around the kingdom and God speaks by way of Jeremiah and says, I want you in turn to make sure you get the message out, not only to Judah, but you make sure you get it out to all these lands around them. Send them stocks and bonds. You give it to them as an example. Let them see it. And you tell them that I, the God of the universe, have already made my decision that you, Jerusalem, Judah, Israel, and all the other lands around here, all of you are going to be in subjection to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, how would you like to get a message like that? How would you handle it? And God's not going to do this. But if we lived in a time such that God would speak, you know, with a closed vision and give it to me, and I was to stand and say, God spoke to me and said, that uh, we in turn need to surrender ourselves to the Chinese. We need to surrender ourselves to the Russians. And our response, your response, will be similar to their response. They fought it. And I, don't, I can't take the time, uh, time to get into it, but I'm trusting that you remember the passage. But they fought it. And they rebelled against it. And the destruction was great because of it. But when it was all said and done, they were in captivity exactly like God said. And so here, we're going back to the issue of resisting, fighting. Are you fighting God? That's what they were doing. They thought they were fighting Nebuchadnezzar. They weren't. They were fighting God. They were fighting God. Now you're in 1 Samuel. Turn there. We're almost done. 1 Samuel. Talking about our responses to... Um, how do we respond to authority? 1 Samuel in chapter 1. Or chapter 15, I mean. And so this is the story of, uh, of Saul. And Saul, in turn, was commanded to uh, take the army, go in and fight the Amalekites, utterly destroy them, every beast, every person, and, to take, and also the king. And uh, you know the story. You know what happened. He went in there. He killed. Uh, they conquered the land. And they brought back with them the best of, including the king. And so Samuel then, when he shows up, uh, Samuel in turn asked him, you know, why didn't he obey the Lord? And uh, he said, well, I wanted to make sacrifices. You know, we brought back all this, these animals to make sacrifices. And we brought back the king for this reason and this reason and so forth. And then the people, they wanted this and so forth. And the interesting study, when you, when you realize that Samuel or that Saul in turn had, had stopped idolizing God and he started idolizing everything else. And so uh, you're in 1 Samuel 15. Are you there? Say amen. Look at verse 23, 22. It says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to, uh, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken unto the fat of rams. And by the way, it's interesting. Verse number 23 says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and adultery, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath all also rejected thee from the kingdom. And it, what's interesting about this is that at the ending of Saul's life, that is exactly what he was doing. He was finding the witch of Endor. 
because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And what, what exactly, what is meant by that? This, this idea of rebellion against, disobeying against the express commands of God, that, and that rebellion in turn is literally idol worship. You're denying God to be king of your life. You're denying God the authority that you have, He has in your life. And by doing this, you're, you're thereby setting up another God, another something that you in turn idolize and you give. In this case, Samuel, Saul said, well, the people wanted. And there was something there, an image that he was trying to maintain, a favor that he wanted. And so in turn, he, he shifted his worship unto the Lord God, and he gave his worship unto these people. And the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's exactly what it means. And stubbornness, and stubbornness here in verse number 23 is as iniquity and adultery. And stubbornness is interesting. It, this is our response. You know, there's times that I resist from things that God is doing in my life, and He brings things to me, people and circumstances, to try to help condition me to accept and to say and yield myself. Haven't we done that with our children? We see that they're not receiving what we're saying. We walk up, we put our arm around them and say, now listen. Have you ever had a child that stiffens up? <laughs> That's stubbornness. What they're saying is, I don't care what you say. I don't care what. I don't care. I've already made my mind. But I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not flexible. I'm stiff. I'm talking about I have a stiff neck. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. And so this rebellion is a sin. Of, and, and stubbornness, it says here, is as uh, iniquity and idolatry. And so both of these sins, they evidence... They evidenced the hard heart of Saul that he in turn had rejected the word of God. That it didn't care what God said. It had no care at all. He, he in turn had no mind. It didn't even matter what God said. He didn't want nothing to do with what God said. And Samuel comes in and all that Saul had to do was just repent. Our God understands we make mistakes. He just he could repent, but he couldn't even acknowledge that. And here, Samuel, if you can say it in, in this way, that he is in turn putting his arm around Saul and trying to bring him to repentance, but Saul in turn is stiffening up. He's going to hold to his excuses. He's going to hold to his, what he feels was the right to be disobedient unto the commandments that were given to him by God. And so to know God's will and deliberately disobey it puts ourselves above God. And in turn, we become our own God. And that is, in reality, it's the vilest form of idolatry. Psalms 51, 16, David made the same mistake. I, I think that David was taught this by Samuel. Listen to what he said. Thou desirest not sacrifice else I would give it. Thou desirest not burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not, will not despise. Samuel said here, and this is prior to David writing in the book of Psalms, he said this, Hath not the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. My friend David learned that by Samuel. I believe that. He taught it to him. And now David wrote in Psalms 51, after he had disobeyed, after he had rebelled and he had impregnated um, uh, um, Bathsheba. Bathsheba, thank you. I was going to say Jezebel. I had Jezebel in my mind. <laughs> uh, impregnated Bathsheba, and then he killed her husband Uriah, and then hid his sin for nine months, walk around acting as though he was right with God. And in turn, God concluded, uh, brought to him a messenger that revealed his sin, made him admit his sin to him. And so, and that's important to understand, that whole concept. And I just, I just have to hasten. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. The mighty hand of God is authority that God's placed in your life. Humble yourself under it. Verse number 6 says, Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for your souls. Verse 7, or verse number 8, eight says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, uh, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Can I say to you, that all three of those verses are tied together. Humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God, your, your response to authority in your life many times generates cares and burdens. I get it. I get it. Governments in turn have been 
you know, vexing their citizens for many years. But yet, Christians have the, have the responsibility to be, be, to be the best citizens in that country. And so what do you do? You cast your care upon the Lord. Many are women that have married husbands, and somewhere along the way, he changed and took a left turn. And, and uh, you say, what do you do? You cast your care upon the Lord. Because if not, your adversary, he's as a roaring lion, he's seeking whom he may devour. And Satan walks around looking for that person that wants to practice with witchcraft. That wants to, uh, wants to deny the authority that God has ordained in their life so that in turn they can exalt their own authority. There's nothing. I don't, I don't know if there's a more pertinent subject for us to, to talk about and nor is there a more grave subject for us to practice than that of authority. And uh, I've, I'm, um, I think I can say this accurately, but this is foreign material. You know, some of you gray-headed folks, when you were little, you knew when you walked into town that the person behind the clerk, whatever they said, you had to listen to them. Someone in the street, an adult in the street, that you in turn had to be respectful, you knew that. It's been shocking to me today Today, it's hard-pressed to get children to respect and obey their parents. And outside of that, you won't hardly get anything else. I've been dressed down by, dressed down by kids before because their parents got upset with me about something and they run into me in the store and they just dress me up 10, 12-year-old kids. They know nothing about nothing. And so... Uh, we, we, in turn, as adults, need to practice and show a soberness about authority because it's consequential. You see that? Shall recede to themselves, damn it. There's consequences involved. And uh, perhaps, perhaps we, we're today reaping what we really sowed. It'd be nice to point all the fingers and, and to put it upon uh, liberals. But perhaps we, I'm talking about as a nation, we're really reaping what we have sowed. Because we have so embraced rebellion for so many years. We've listened to the music of it. We've watched it. We've laughed about it. We've carried on. We've, we have in turn it so that now we have, a, we have a strange spirit in our country. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And I read just uh, two days ago, there's uh, someone running the primaries up in New York or New Hampshire. There's a trans... A trans... A trans... Vest, uh, trans, uh, transsexual um, Satanist and won the Republican nomination as senator in the state of New, New Hampshire. Wow. So we can't even accept, we can't even accept the fact that homosexuality is, is abject rebellion against God. We can't even accept that. We've tiptoed around it. Our preachers struggle with it. We all struggle with it. And it's been, we're all, in one way or another, been touched by it. And I understand that. Friends and family, people that we love, we've been touched by it. But it's still rebellion against God. It's rebellion. All right, to stand. The Bible just pray when we be dismissed. Father, we pray that you help us to be a people subject unto you. Help us, Lord, to submit ourselves unto you in all things. And Lord, I pray. I pray for our nation. I pray, Lord, for revival to come through this nation. And no doubt, Lord, that if revival comes to this nation, it's going to come with us. And Lord, the most basic, most basic building block of a revival is that we, we will just lay down our arms and submit ourselves to you. Lord, help us to do that. And Lord, it's complicated because of, of those who in turn are over us whether it's politicians or a government, whether it's in a family, or even sometimes, Lord, in a church. So hard to do. Lord, help us to see that, um, that we, in turn, are submitting ourselves as unto the Lord. Please. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. You're missed this. <laughs>